Welcome to the Emerging Civil War Podcast. I'm Chris Mikowski, and joining me today is the 2024 recipient of the Emerging Civil War Award for Service in Civil War Public History, Gordon Jones. Gordon, how are you? Doing great. Thank you, Chris. And 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 thank you for this for this award. I I I keep it right here beside me. <laughs> Well, uh, we were delighted to be able to recognize all the great work you've been doing at the Atlanta History Center and just the way that you've been uh, kind of making the Civil War's story central to the the great story that the city has to share. So thanks for all your work, man. Well, I, I, I appreciate that. And um, it the award means a lot to me coming from, as it does, fellow historians involved in the same things that we're involved in and I'm involved in, you know, with, with public history, with civil war, the civil war era, trying to, uh, you know, just trying to find all these different ways where we can communicate with folks. Hey, this is an important part of our history. This is, this is a, the, the essence of our history. So, you know, y'all, y'all are playing the same game as I am. And I, so I really appreciate it. It feels like, uh, you know, an award from from comrades in arms. <laughs> well, we certainly recognize the great work you've been doing. It is a mouthful to say, Emerging Civil War Award for Public Service and blah, 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 blah. So uh, uh, if you find a convenient way to explain that to your friends, please let me know, because I'd like to make some crib notes on that myself. Fair. <laughs> so it's it's been a challenging few years to practice public history in the civil war realm. Um, how are you feeling about that overall? Uh, well, to your, to your point, um, you know, when, when I say emerging civil war, some people say, what, is that a prediction for the future? I said, no, no, no. But thank you for asking, because you know what, in fact, that is a connection that a lot of people are drawing these days. And you know what, I'll take it because anything that can, that we can use to, um, help people understand how relevant this period was and how learning from the Civil War era informs us and makes us better citizens and makes us better prepared for what we're going through in our present day and what we will see in the future. You know, that that's good. So, you know, I'll, I'll take it. Present day relevance is everything. Uh, you know, we got to keep this thing uh, something that the, the the younger folks can be interested in, and this is not just the realm of a bunch of old white-haired, bearded guys like me. Uh, I've got plenty of white-haired, beardedness mm. going on myself. <laughs> <laughs> so, so let's uh, let's backtrack a little bit and uh, talk a little bit about your own Civil War origin story. What got you when you weren't quite so um, white-haired and bearded? Uh, what got you interested in the Civil War in the first place? Mm. Well, all right. So I got to I got to say this. It was in large measure. It was Bruce Catton's American Heritage Picture History of the Civil War, uh, which was produced during the centennial. You know, the one and a lot of you out there listening know the one. This is the one that has the maps that had the individual little soldiers drawn into them from maps of all the battles. And when I'm, you know, circa 10 12 years old, I spent hours poring over those maps and trying to figure out, wait a minute, is, would this really be to scale? Would the little soldiers really be this big? You know? So I, I got hooked, you know, uh, and I'm, I was born in 1962. So I, I really kind of missed the centennial, but I still was in the backwash. And so a lot of those products were still out there. So Bruce Catton and some of that, um, some of that er early kind of um, the the commercial aspects of the Civil War that that we don't do anymore from the Centennial period, that really got me going. I was also, you know, quite frankly, I was in the backwash of um, of the the Davy Crockett. Oh, yeah. And and Daniel Boone, you know, Fess Parker, and and you know, I'd say the Great Locomotive Chase, the Disney movie. That was huge for me um, as a kid. So um, that that certainly was part of it. It it of course it really helped that my father is also an historian, although not in American history. He did Asian history, Chinese and Indian history. So that helped. And then um, 
you know, I, 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 when I got to be college age, 19, uh, I, I participated in my first Civil War reenactment and got hooked on that. So like a lot of us of a certain age uh, that are now in the history field, public history field especially, we got our start doing reenacting, mm -hmm. which was kind of the, you know, that's the, the and, and that get, gives you that perspective of the ordinary soldier, you know, it's kind of bottom up history and less the top down history, you know, the, I feel like a lot of what we got in the centennial was sort of, you know, generals and battles. And then, you know, when when we were coming along in our teens and 20s, then it was kind of the opposite. It's like, I want to I want to find out about how, you know, how they cooked over the fire, how the rifle musket works, how the tactics work. You know, what does it feel like? So that that was that was huge um, for me uh, coming along. Now, as I listen to the the story you tell, and I just kind of see all these neat little bits of uh, irony, I suppose, little bits of breadcrumb. You talk about the great locomotive chase being so important, and now you're in charge of, of part of that history or the pictorial history that caught your interest, and you're in charge of one of the greatest pictures of the Civil War ever painted. Like, I think those resonances are really neat. They, they are. And, and, you know, I mean, I'm, boy, you know, we're, I'm so lucky, you know, we're all, we're all so lucky that we get to do this stuff. And, um, you know, but I mean, yeah, sure. Sometimes you make your own luck. I mean, you know, it's, it's hard work. It is, but, you know, we also, I, I feel like Chris, you know, we all stand on the shoulders of giants. You know, we all are continuing what that previous generation did. You know, I mentioned Bruce Cat and I never met the man. But I can still count him as a sort of mentor because it was with that book and those little, you know, those maps of little soldiers. And it was with with Fess Parker, you know, that 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 was those were those trigger moments. And, you know, that's what I've heard from so many people. You know, I actually ended up writing my dissertation uh, at Emory about Civil War reenacting. And um, one of the things that I found in common with so many people that I interviewed for that was this, this trigger moment. You know, what was the thing that really got you going? And, and I was surprised at how many people got going over the exact same things that I did. So many people mentioned uh, Bruce Catton, or they would, or at that point, you know, in the, um, they would mention, um, uh, that I, I was writing this in the early 2000s. So they would mention Ken Burns yeah. and they would mention Shelby Foote. And I, you know, I know what you may say about Shelby Foote and Ken Burns, man, I get all that, but they gave us trigger moments. Yeah. And as long as people can just get that little, that little seed of interest, that little thing in there that makes you go, boy, I sure want to know more. And it's not just intellectual, it's also emotional. If you, if you get that punch, all right, man, you're in, you're hooked. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, mentioning Ken Burns and, and Shelby Foote, both of whom, as artists, I love them. I absolutely love them. And, you know, say what you will about Shelby Foote, that man knew how to tell a story. Or say what you will about Ken Burns, he knew how to make a movie that really grabbed people's uh, heartstrings, you know. And like you said, those, those moments in then, turn into something else, you know, uh, deeper and more significant for folks. So, so what was it that made you make the step from, from loving this to like, Hey, I think I want to make a career out of doing this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that, that was, that's, I've asked myself that uh, many times, like, why didn't I just, why didn't I just become a locksmith, man? I could have made some money out of that, you know, or <laughs> these, you know, so, um, uh, I, I guess really, um, when I came to understand out of college in the mid eighties, that there was such a thing as public history and there was training that one could get in such a thing. And at that point I'm living in, um, in uh, upstate South Carolina and, uh, Oh, there's a program at Columbia, South Carolina. Well, uh, great. You know, and it was, it was a sort of an expedient thing. It was like, well, there's this thing I can do. And, um, you know, I was interested in plenty of other things, but this is the thing that turned out like, well, that's the thing I can, I can start. Let me just start with this. 
And um, I was able to then sort of translate a lot of that sort of Civil War reenacting interest uh, that went directly over to what I was getting then in public history uh, training at that point. And, you know, of course, you realize now, looking back, you know, I mean, I finished with that program. I, I was out of Columbia in 1990. Um, and, you know, you, you realize how much of what you really needed to know, you still didn't know after going through classes, right? I mean, because so much of what you need to know to do the job is on the job. And it's, um, but it, but it, it, it depends, and it depends so much on making these contacts outside of the institution. You know, it's, it's, it's being out there among the collectors, among reenactors among among you know all the folks that are watching us today um historic preservation you know uh book clubs civil war roundtables you know there's this huge mass public following for the the civil war era and you, you gotta you gotta get outside the office and you gotta have those contacts and that you know to me i feel like that's where i'm i'm learning I have learned, I'm still learning stuff, right? How much How much of what I needed to know about um, Civil War firearms and uniforms did I learn in grad school? Zero. How much of that did I learn from reenactors, from collectors? Pretty much all of it. And, and that's something you deal with in the collection all the time. So like you, you, you have to have that kind of practical knowledge for what you're doing. You do, but I mean, I, but you also need, you know, you also need the book knowledge. Yeah. And uh, so the, the cool thing is that you get to do both. Yeah. So, you know, it, it, it has so many advantages over locksmithing, uh, aside from the salary, you know, the, the money difference, right? But it always oh, just been, it, it's been great. And, um, you know, what I, what I really love about doing all this stuff, and you're probably right there with me, is you get those emotional moments when you, you still get trigger moments yeah. you know you still get things and and it can come almost at any time without warning with somebody you know that you're engaged with and suddenly you realize oh so that's what that was oh i'm able to put two and two together or you watch somebody else who has that same reaction to something you're doing or somebody that just says thank you yeah. you know that that that, that, that makes you know that that makes a difference Huge difference. And and the other thing too that I really think is important about that book learning that you talk about too is like, you know, it teaches you kind of how to inquire and how to think. Um, certainly in my field, uh, in the communications realm, for instance, and, and in public history, like the sorts of things we do today aren't aren't things that they could have even taught us back in the day because the technology has changed so much, the practices have changed so much. There there would have been no way to anticipate that, but by teaching us how to be thinkers we're able to kind of learn and adapt as that stuff changes. Ain't it so? And um, you know what else? Uh, the, um, you know, the, the, you, you realize that everything that, that um, you're doing now in terms of civil war historiography, okay. Not only was it not around 30 years ago, but it's going to be different in another 30 years from present. So, you know, the, the the history, the facts are always back there, but the questions that we ask about them and the questions that historians ask about, they're going to be different over time. So, um, you know, uh, some, you know, as we are now preparing at the Atlanta History Center for our, to, to put up our new core Civil War exhibition to replace the one that we put up in 1996, and we're, we're going to roll that out in 2026. So I've I've waded back into the historiography, and when I you know when I started started wading when we finished with the Cyclorama project in in 2019 2020, um, I I realized you know I thought oh I I can do this in my sleep I already know what the Civil War was about right oh no 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 um let let, let look at all of the new books and the up and coming scholars that we have now who who are bringing up evidence and interpreting evidence and uh finding things that i would never seen before 
uh, using the internet, using, you know, ancestry.com and newspapers.com, fold three, and coming up with, with new ways to look at those facts that, that, that have just been wonderful to me. There's been lot, lots and lots of trigger moments about, you know, just learning all these, these things. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that I like about the exhibit that you currently have, um, where you sort of frame things, the civil war as a turning point and these turning points, um, which I thought was a really provocative in a very good way to, uh, to approach thinking about, uh, an epic in our history that, um, maybe we think we know about, but don't. And, and I really like the way that exhibit challenged us to kind of rethink what we thought we know. Well, we, we were going to, we are going to continue that, <laughs> that trend. We, we want to continue challenging you. And you know what, in, there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with what we put up in 1996, except that it's no longer 1996, right? You know, that was that era of Ken Burns and reenactors and, and, you know, social history and so forth. We, we don't live in that time anymore. We're in the post-pandemic, post-George Floyd world. This is a different place. And people are now asking different questions. And so, you know, they, they and, you know, our audiences want to know, um, you know, how is this relevant to what we're going through today, right? What, I see things going on in the news. Where did that come from? And I want somebody who is reliable that I can sort of trust to tell me about the history because it's, it's hard to find those trustworthy places. And, um, you know, look, we, we have, and, and we're Atlanta too, right? So we're, you know, we're a different place now than we were then. We're a very diverse city. We have very diverse audiences. I'm, I'm proud to say that are starting to, to come here. Uh, where is that freedom story, that slavery story? It really wasn't there in 1996, the way I think it should be now. Where was the story of the American Civil War in context with, say, for example, what's going on in Europe or in the rest of the Western Hemisphere, for that matter. There's a whole school of, of thought now about, you know, the transnational uh, context of the American Civil War. Well, that's that's something that was that I had not really thought about and had not really thought to put with that exhibit in 1996. Now, we will still have, and we always will have, a collections-based and an evidence-based approach to things i mean i want to see the stuff i want to yeah. see the real stuff i want to see the actual thing and we have that and i want i want guns i want uniforms i want drums i want buttons i want all that stuff you know that's that's still there but um i also want to challenge folks to think about okay what did all those things mean you know what does it mean that you had a um uh, an industrial society in the Connecticut River Valley that was able to make these technologically advanced firearms, these breech loaders and repeating rifles, mass produce them, interchangeable parts technology versus, you know, a, a Southern society that was essentially st still based largely in enslaved labor. When industrial revolution really hadn't taken place, hadn't really set in except for a few urban areas. Civil War shows you what happens when those two things come in conflict with each other. Mm -hmm. And so there, there's there's lots of stories that you can tell, new stories, even using those old artifacts. Now, people love stuff, and you guys have an incredible collection of stuff. I mean, it's pretty impressive. What's it like to go into work every day and be like, you get to just be among the stuff? Well, wow. Yeah, I know. Well, most of the time I, I, I've, I've kind of gotten jaded, you know, but, but that's, that's when you, but you still have those trigger moments when you realize, dang, wow, look at this, man. And I'm so lucky, um, you know, and you, you're able when you, you know, you see something and you're able to, to literally walk out of my office, down the hallway, go into the secure storage area 
and check the serial number on this one firearm to find out that it was actually used in such and such a place and in such and such an event. That's super cool. <laughs> I remember the, the the time that you took me back into the collection to just show me the, the wealth of material culture that you guys have to work with. And uh, to me, as a storyteller, it's neat to have those sorts of artifacts to help tell you tell the stories you know i mean that's what it what a great set of props you, know? you got you got to have them and uh and you know and it's it and we we have evolved and and again we stand on the shoulders of giants i mean you know we in the um you know when i came to work here in 1991 um i was hired to essentially uh supervise and and move the the uh, beverly debose collection from his house um, to our museum because it had just been donated and then to take all those things and build an exhibit with it. And we also had the, uh, the Tom Dickey collection of artillery projectiles. Well, one of the things that DeBose always said, and he kind of left us with this, you know, with sort of a, a, a um, a, a, a directive, if you will, he's, he, you know, this is my wish. I want this collection to be organic. I want it to expand. You know, I want it to continue on. This is never a drop the mic moment. So, you know, during my time here, we've been able to acquire the George Ray Confederate collection. We've been able to, uh, uh, went to Australia uh, to see uh, my friend Lynn Trainer, who was the, sort of the, the bow to bows of Australia uh, with his collection. Uh, several other collections that are that are underway for us right now, and we've been able to add those things. So you know, why 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 can't we, um, you know, why why can't we uh, build one of the finest collections of Civil War material culture? You know, why shouldn't that be in Atlanta? Why why not? You know, we 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 got we got there's plenty of this to to help folks. Um, to, to kind of help visualize the past and then fill the past. Let's bring it here. Let's, let's, let's let, let's let people, uh, let's let people play with the toys as much as we can, because that's, that's the, that's one of the great ways. That's the way I've learned. That's probably the way you learn. That's the way a lot of people learn. Let's, let's, let's get that. Now, one of the things, you know, kind of thinking about the artifacts as a way to tell the story and build the exhibit, and I want to I'll go back to a comment you said a second ago about the questions people are asking today, and thinking about how kind of the theme of your current exhibits has, has essentially been there for almost 30 years. So it seems like one of your challenges is not just to respond to the questions people are asking today, but then also sort of anticipating the sorts of questions they'll be asking tomorrow and next year. Um, what kind of challenge is that for you as a curator trying to kind of build that out? Yeah, that there's, there's the thing, you know, you, you, you don't know. Um, the only thing I'm, I'm fairly certain of is that 30 years down the line, um, people are going to look at us and say, golly, those guys were a bunch of dumbasses. Why didn't they do this? Why didn't you do that? You know? And, um, when we were working on the, um, restoration of the battle of Atlanta, Cyclorama, my, uh, colleague and I, Jackson McQuick, who was um, so instrumental in, in, in heading up that project, you know, we, we, we knew, and we still know that in 30 years time, when it, when it's time for the next great uh, conservation or restoration effort on that painting, they will scrutinize every single thing that we did, and they will be as critical of us as we were of the previous group that that uh, that did that in the, in the early 1980s, and yet you know seriously, and yet you know there's still there's respect because you know that uh, were it not for what that previous generation did, you wouldn't have anything to work with right now. But yeah, it's it's hard to anticipate what is the thing that is going to to really resonate in. 10 20 years time you know these these big exhibitions that we put together are uh have a tendency to go static uh especially when there's no endowment be behind them and you know you don't have a whole lot of staff and you can't change out stuff all right we, we've learned our lesson about that yeah. here at the history center 
And so we're going into this project with an endowment and with the full knowledge that we are going to have changes and we are going to update the exhibition and we are going to add and rotate artifacts in and out and we're going to have new things and there's going to be those new questions that people are going to ask so but we we got to build in some flexibility we don't know what those questions are always going to be i have a fair idea of some of them but i don't know you know for sure i i think the the what what i what i see going uh as a future trend is i i think uh people are going to be much more concerned with the political aspects of the American Civil War. I think much more concerned with the, uh, the ethnic uh, and or racial um, aspects to the American Civil War and how that impacts, you know, what, what we're looking at in the future, multicultural United States. Uh, people are going to be looking back to the Civil War to look for the roots of these things, to also look for the roots of the expansion of democratic freedoms, of, matter of fact, just looking for the definitions of democracy and of Republican government, small r Republican government. You know, they're, they're going to be looking back to the Civil War. Civil War is the big touchstone, as you know. You know, and everybody's going to be reaching back for that and reconstruction, reconstruction, which really is not the right term, but I don't I don't have a better one. Um, yeah, people are going to be looking back at this whole era. And that's why we like to I, I like to say now that we're we're building an exhibition about the Civil War era, not just the Civil War. Yeah. yeah. And uh, to me, that's such a much more constructive way to look at it, because if you get caught in the X's and O's on the battle map and, you know, who's moving where, you sort of forget that larger why and the 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 hows and the ramifications and the echoes forward. And uh, it becomes a little too short-sighted to look at it just that way. Yeah, but but it's the X's and O's on the battle map that determine the outcome okay. that made all those other things possible. So that that's just as important. So, you know, I'm a, I'm a big proponent of, of quote-unquote military history, although I don't think there's anything purely military ever about military history is political social economic it's all that yeah. but yeah we, we got it we got we, we we have a big tent right we're a big tent yeah you know this whole thing that we're doing here with with the, the civil war civil war era what you're what, what you're doing what we're all doing it's a big tent we 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 welcome a lot of different kind of folks so um one of the show pieces that you have that I was super impressed by that when you had the chance to show me was uh, your large uh, railroad piece, the, the general, you know, it's hard to miss. There it is. Boom, big, beautiful, bold, and famous. Um, tell me a little bit about that as a piece of the collection and, and, you know, how central it is to the story you're telling. Oh, Chris, see, I, when you said what you were going, you were impressed with, I thought for sure you were going to talk about those sexually explicit letters that we looked at. <laughs> they were sassy, weren't they? <laughs> talk about a collection. <laughs> like I say, big tent. But um, yeah, you know the 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 the, the locomotive Texas. Which, oh, Texas. Oh, did I say the general? The general. Well, whatever. Whatever. Right, but yeah. here's you the. Here, you know, I'm I'm going. I'm just going to say this. For everybody, because you'll understand it's okay. You know what? Great locomotive chase. Who won that chase? The Texas. Who lost that chase? The General. Okay. Sorry, Fest Parker. <laughs> but I'm, I'm being facetious. Um, the the you know the importance of that locomotive. You know, yeah, it it was saved from the scrapyard because it was famous in the Great Locomotive Chase, and because the great Atlanta historian Wilbur Kurtz and others in the the, the old timers of the Western and Atlantic Railroad uh, knew about it and were able, able to save it from the scrap heap uh, back in, in the early 1900s, circa 19, between 1907 and 1912. And um, so that's why it was saved. But, you know, the locomotive served between Chattanooga and Atlanta for 51 years. You know, so it and it and you know this is from 1856 through 1907. So it's 
you know, it, it's hauling freight. It first hauled passengers and it's hauling freight all the way through the, the, what we call, you know, the new South era of, of Atlanta, right. When Atlanta is becoming this uh, transport, the, the big transportation industrial hub, you know, it, it's, it was the, uh, the workhorse of the, of the transportation network that built the, the quote unquote new South. That is the, that is a great story. Uh, Atlanta is a railroad city. We were founded on the railroad. There's no navigable river up. Chattahoochee's not navigable up this far. Our on the city seal before the Civil War. What was on the city seal? A locomotive, a four four zero locomotive. I might add. So it it's 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 central to our story in Atlanta, uh, which is part of the reason we put it on the front of the building and basically a big glass box that everybody can see from the you know as they drive by. But, you know, it, it's rooted in the Civil War, but it's more than the Civil War. And, and all you got to do is say, OK, why was why are we even here? Why, why was Sherman here? Why do we even have a Civil War Museum? Because of that locomotive, because it was a transportation and, and manufacturing hub. That's what made it the target of Union armies. That's what made all the difference. And it was that outcome that in large measure change the course of the 1864 election so here we go why you know why would we have this in atlanta well because it's an important it was an important destination then it's an important destination now it's an important outcome for everything that we are in our nation today that's one of the things I think that your museum does so well is like here's an artifact and, and maybe you know something about it maybe you don't but then here are all these other connections and questions and memory you know like avenues of exploration which i think is something a good museum should do and so like you know when i first had the opportunity to see the locomotive when you showed it to me and it's like okay so here's what i know about the the texas but then here's what i don't know about the railroad history and here's what i don't know and it's just like wow it just opened up so many cool things for me to learn and think about it, it it is, and and you know, I had to make sure that that uh, Fest Parker w was in our exhibition. Okay, also the little plastic model of the general that was used as a decanter by the Jim Beam Company back in the day. I mean, there are certain certain things you just got to have. So now if you, you've talked several times about those aha uh -huh moments, those those um, those moments of illumination, and and I have to say, one of the great coolest privileges i've ever had in my civil war career was the first time you took me to the cyclorama it was still in the middle of the restoration you sh took me behind the scenes you showed me everything that was coming together you told me about how the plan would would come together and it, it, i left that day pinching myself thinking like this can't be real this was such an incredible experience uh and then i had the privilege to come back after it was all done and then you gave me a tour and and told me the story of the cyclorama with the American Battlefield Trust. And again, it was like, I, I can't believe I'm having this extraordinarily wonderful experience. I mean, they were both just such privileges. Um, what's your connection to the cyclorama? And, and tell us a little bit about how you helped to bring that about. And I know you had a whole team of folks to work with to do that. We, we, we did. And it, you know, it is definitely a group, a group effort. Um, it, you know, is a huge engineering project is a huge fundraising project is, is just a huge thing for the entire city of Atlanta. Uh, you know, my involvement with that really kind of goes back to what was going on at, at the Gettysburg cyclorama in the mid two thousands. And I ended up on an advisory board for the Park Services and the Foundation, Gettysburg Foundation Museum and Visitor Center. And in the process of, you know, so I was going up there twice a year. So I would get to see the progress on the cyclorama as it was being done. And I met Sue Boardman, who turns out to be one of my big mentors on, on uh, all of this. And Sue introduced me to the, the, not only the history, but the art and the the concepts of art that that go with um, panoramic paintings, as they're better known. Uh, joined the um, International Panorama Council, which is a you know international group that deals with 
panoramic paintings and panoramic representations, and you have artists, you have historians, you have um, uh, practicing uh, folks who are still working in this medium. Um, and, you know, so I'm, I'm just, just soaking this up. This is circa 2010, 2011, and it was around that time. That, I mean, the History Center, we had been sort of aware of this issue in Grant Park where the where the painting was, where, you know, the 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 um, anticipated revenue from gate receipts there, uh, the way it was set up by the city in the in the early 80s was not working and they, they weren't able to maintain the painting. They weren't able to hang on to enough staff. And so the painting was beginning to suffer. And we realized as we were kind of looking at the history of this thing, how much there was, there's so much history that was unknown. A lot of that was stuff that was, that we were able to, to coax out of the internet uh, coax out of our friends with the with the American uh, with the International Panorama uh, Council. Uh, the the diary of the lead artist had been discovered uh, up in Milwaukee, so all this stuff is starting to come together. And um, the mayor appointed a task force 2011-12 to look into this this issue that basically they had with the cyclorama, instead of having an asset that would bring in money, they had a liability that was going to cost $30 million to get fixed. And um, so we began thinking about, hey, I wonder if this thing would fit on our campus, you know, because this this makes sense for us. Rather than building a whole new building there, why don't you just attach to the building that we have? And we already have the parking land, we have the bathrooms, you know, and all this stuff. Long and the short of it is, is that we... Um, the, the mayor's task force produced a report. Uh, that report appeared in the newspaper. And everybody said, well, you know, the Atlanta History Center would be a great place, but there's no funding. And that's when the Whitakers, uh, <laughs> the Whitaker family uh, saw this and in the newspaper and uh, called our CEO and said, hey, uh, we see that you have this thing and we'd like to make a contribution to the city. Uh, would $10 million help you? Let's have lunch, says our CEO. <laughs> and from there, we were able to leverage the money. From there, we were able then to make an arrangement with the city to have the thing moved, to have the restoration done. That came with the Texas. And, you know, then uh, the, the last piece of the puzzle was that the 1921 building, which was down there at the zoo, uh, was repurposed for the zoo and turned into an event space and, a, and, a, and an overlook site uh, over the elephants exhibition. So it, it turned out that all the pieces and parts and the alignment of the planets just turned out just so. And we got it all done just before COVID set in, right? COVID came in about a year, about a year later, we, we were under lockdown. Yeah. Wow. So, it, and as far as just plans of like getting people in, starting to pay for this project through gate receipts again, that must have been a kind of a, a financial challenge you guys weren't expecting, obviously. Ah, good, good point, Chris. Thank you. Uh, the Whitaker Endowment is there on top. It was a, it was a $36 million project with a $10 million endowment. So it's really a $26 million build all in. I mean, everything, building, locomotive, everything. That $10 million is what is going to save us from falling into that trap again. So you know what? Even if not another person ever walks in as a paying guest to the Atlanta History Center, which we don't want to happen, but even if that were to happen, that money would still be there drawing interest and accumulating over time for that day, which will come inevitably. It will come when we will need to reinvest it in this painting, this organic structure that will always need care. Right. So one, one of the, you know, the, 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 in, a, in a certain way, the, the greatest accomplishment that we have here is that we have made that artifact. We have given it a, um, a, a stable financial footing that we think will go forward, you know, for another century 
or at least it'll be after I die. And after that, you know, someone whatever. else's problem. <laughs> yeah. One of the things I really liked about the way you ended up displaying the painting was that I could walk in there and sort of interact with the painting on my terms. Um, whereas like, for instance, if you go to Gettysburg, there's a show, you know, beginning, middle and end, and there's a light show and a sound show and everything. Whereas you guys really sort of allow people to come in and interact with the painting, spend as much or as little time with it, reading all the the stuff that you have about behind the scenes and the engineering and the history of it. And to me, that was a really meaningful experience because, you know, I think it goes back to your earliest point about how we how we connect with history and it really gave me the opportunity to connect with that painting in a, in a significant way well thanks and that, and that was very intentional and um and we we learned a lot from from the gettysburg uh, project and one of the things we learned is that we are not gettysburg and we we do not have the same sort of dynamic at work that they do they have you know how many how many million people a year uh, go through that park and how many people do they have to get through that visitor center so they had to have a way to uh to get folks in and out and on and off that platform uh in a way that we that we don't have to because our visitation is not nearly that big <laughs> you know we, we're we're about you know what 20 percent of that um so we had a, in a certain way we had a a a, a luxury, the luxury of being able to to rethink this, and what the other thing was is that seeing the um, seeing the setups in a couple of the uh, panoramic paintings, or they're they're called panoramas usually in in Europe, where the American term is cyclorama. But looking at the Waterloo painting is in its original building uh, from early in the twentieth century. Uh, there's a crucifixion scene in Bavaria at Altoding that is in its original building uh, with its original diorama. And so when you're, you know, when I visited those things and realized, you know what, you can actually go underneath the painting at Altoding the way that they had set it up, where you can, you know, there's a level underneath the viewing platform. So, man, that's pretty cool. I, thought, I wonder if we could do that. Oh, and this is the way that the platforms were constructed when you know back in the day when you know when the thing was painted why can't we do that and give our visitors that same experience that the visitors in 1886 would have had so that's why we wanted to set up the um, platform the way we did for old timers who came to the atlanta painting uh to the atlanta psychorama in grant park in its old location there was a revolving platform Right. You, 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 did you ever visit it? No, I hadn't. No. Right. It, it was it was a series. It was basically it was a, a big carpeted bleacher set. And then the whole thing revolved. And as it revolved, the painting was lit in certain sections. And there was a recorded narration that told you what was going on in the battle. But you never got to see the entire painting at once. Well, that was anathema to the way that the artists were thinking about it in the 1880s. You know, that's a very 20th century kind of movie, you know, pan over the scene kind of way of thinking. Well, they, they didn't know that. So we wanted to get it to where people could see it all at once. The only um, the only thing that was really standing in our way is modern fire codes, oh, yeah. uh, safety measures. And, um, you know, folks uh, need to be able to access the platform and not everybody can do stairs. Yeah. So you, get, you, need, you need an escalator. You need uh, an elevator. And for fire codes, you need two ways on and off. So I tell people, look, I don't like the 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 exit signs on the platform any more than you do, but we got to have them. If we really went back to 1886, we would have an old, dusty wooden building with a single spiral set of staircase in the middle that was a big giant fire trap. So we can't have that. Right. So it's the best that we could do in you know, in the, in the 21st century to give you that 19th century feeling. But it was really neat the way that you can go and, and appreciate it, not just as a piece of art, but as a piece of engineering and seeing the parabola curve of the painting and the way you, and it's so just, you know, I'm amazed and, and kudos and kudos and kudos to you for, for everything you guys did for that, because you, you really I, unlocked that painting in so many different ways for people. Thank you so for that. Th that's, uh, you know, crown jewel of the collection is there some 
some piece of the collection that most of us might not know about that maybe you just absolutely love and adore? Oh yeah, I mean, there, and yeah, you know, a lot of things we've been we've been working really hard to build our collection um, in the last few years uh, with um, some 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 largely non military things uh, that will will set the story up. So we've been looking at you know um, political history and a, a lot of the campaign memorabilia from eighteen sixty and sixty four and on up. Through 1876, we've been looking at a lot of material that would reflect uh, the transatlantic slave trade and the experience of enslaved people and of freed people and of uh, the the, uh, the the refugee camps. We were able to bring in uh, from an auction uh, the the garrison flag that flew over Craney Island uh, off of the up there at nor in the Norfolk area, which was a "Quote unquote contraband camp or a freedman's camp for a brief time in 1863. Now the flag is in in tatters. It's it's about half of it's gone. But this was the flag of freedom where everybody was going. I mean, this was the the the, the destination. That flag. That's where I want to go. That's where you know we had a movement of a half a million people in this country to get to the Union lines. That's a that's a huge that's a huge huge story." So we have an artifact that, that will that will help represent that, um, and you know you 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 gotta we we were we have to raise the money for everything. We're a private nonprofit. We don't get any government money. We're a private nonprofit. So you gotta raise the money for this. So it's all about having the donors, but it's also all about having those contacts. It's having and having you know your eyes open and your imagination working. To where you, when you see something that comes up at auction, you can imagine that it could be used and, you know, to to help further the story. Um, we were able to bring in the um, the regimental flag of the 127th U.S. Colored Troops. We were able to bring in uh, one of the dozen or so known by serial number uh, shipped to Kansas by the Immigrant Aid Society. Sharps rifle, Sharps carbines, you know, the Beecher's Bible. I mean, not not just of the type, but I'm talking of the one, uh, the serial number on the list. Uh, you know, and, and there's that sort of thing um, where you can, you know, relate it to a, you know, it's not just a one-off. This is the thing. Yeah. Uh, so we've been aiming for a lot of that stuff. Um, we, we're trying real hard to, to, um, to uh, work on our U.S. Color Troops collection. And that's that's one thing that, you know, why didn't you have more of that kind of stuff? Well, uh, there are several reasons, but one of them is, you know, black troops are issued the same thing as the white troops. So there's no way you can tell them apart. If you have a generic overcoat or generic, uh, you know, firearm, I mean, it's going to be the same for for everything in, in the U in Union Army. Only if you wrote your name on it. All right? Would you know? Now, let's say you did write your name on it. Now, back in the 80s, how are you going to know? Were you going to write away to the National Archives and wait four to six to eight to 12 weeks or whatever it is, and you might get a response that would give you the soldier service record, maybe, if you were lucky. But what if that, you know, what if that name matched several other names? All right, now you got to go through this over and over again. So it was hard to it was hard to work through this. Uh, now you can do all that work in five minutes on full three. <laughs> so you know, I'm uh, we we had a uh, we had a firearm that was was lent to us by one of my good friends in in uh, Charleston, and uh, he said, "We're not think that this gun that we have been using for for re and I knew I knew about it. I remembered you know seeing it." Uh, it was a, a an original 1816 um, uh, model alteration that had um, initial had a name on it, had initials and a name on it, and I knew I remembered it from from my reenacting days. Uh, but he says, you know, I I I got to looking at this, and I think that this may be uh, James H. W. Curtis of the 36th U.S. Colored Troops. So why do you say that? Well, because it shows up, and it's oh, man, I let, let's check that out. And I, I do believe that he was correct, but the only way we were able to do that 
is by going through all these all these records and we were able to eliminate you know as many of the others other folks that had those names to where this is by far the most likely possibility and we couldn't have done that you know 30 years ago so that that's that's one thing that this this really helped a lot we were able to identify these pieces that we couldn't before wow so uh i know we've been talking retrospectively but what's next for gordon jones mm. Uh, I got to survive the next couple of years until we get this project finished. That's the main thing. Uh, after that, I, I, I don't know. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm 62, so we'll, we'll see what, what comes. But I would, uh, I think that um, one thing that we really need is a good uh, definitive picture study coffee table book of the Battle of Atlanta Cyclorama, which we do not have yet. We could certainly use uh, catalogs and a publication similar to the one that we did on the George Ray collection for the DuBose collection and for the other collections that we have. Uh, I mean, I, I feel like that there is a uh, there's a there's still very much a market for that. And there's some some things that I don't that I think they do display well in a, in a in an exhibition, but in a certain way, they display even better in a book. Yeah. Because then you can have the close-up pictures of the marks or the extended discussion and so forth. And of course, you can also do the, that, a lot of that online. So a lot of our project will not only be physical space, but virtual space. And with virtual space, you know, the, you can just expand, you know, in, infinitely. Um, so what I want to do is to is to make sure that we build on these collections that we have and these concepts that we're putting forward and these questions that we're asking let's build on that stuff and let's give something to folks who are going to walk out of this museum and go home and think about what they saw and they're going to be interested hopefully they'll have that trigger moment and you know they want to look it up on the line or somebody halfway around the world who never will ever come here but they will still see you know the work that we've done they'll still see that i mean and, and that's you know that that's what that's what you guys are doing you know it's you're, you're seeing around the world you know we're not we're not just we're not we're not just in the united states anymore yeah it's wonderful what digital technology allows us to do so, yeah. and, and just finally i know that the atlanta history center is a lot more than just civil war history you want to give folks a little pitch to come on down and see what you guys have oh yeah you got it man we we have a a 33 acre oasis in the, in the heart of, uh, of Midtown Atlanta. So we're, you know, you, you get out on our property with all of its gardens and grounds and you're surrounded by green and cool trees and there's a, you know, there's water streams running through and you think, I, am, I, am I in a city? Yes, you are, but it sure doesn't look like it. So we have a, it's a retreat. It's a, it's a great place to go when you're stressed out, but we also have, of course we have the, the museum. That's the, 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 the big part of the biggest building on the campus is the museum. And that's where the Civil War uh, galleries are. That's that's where our History of Atlanta gallery is. That's where we have a uh, the story of the 96 Olympics. We have the Texas. We have the Cyclorama. We have a thing on Bobby Jones. We're going to have a children's exhibition that will open. We're also uh, remaking our Native Lands exhibition about Indians in Georgia. So that's that building. Uh, we have another building, which is uh, houses the Keenan Research Center. So that's your library, your archives. That's all your genealogical needs. That's uh, and it, all this by free parking. OK, just park free. You don't, have to, you know, don't have to fight downtown traffic either. Come do your genealogical work. Got the Swan House, which is the 1930s mansion built by the Cotton Broker family that was original to the property that's that's how we got this property was because of that family the Inmans. we have the uh smith house which is interpreted as an 1860s era north georgia farmstead uh we have a, a log cabin that we're also using to interpret uh that period between you know europe european settlement and indian settlement and that contact period so there's there's plenty to see here. And the, the number one remark that we get is, oh man, I can't, I'll possibly do all this in one day, which brings me to my, you need to buy a membership speech, but I'm going to save that. 
<laughs> well, I'll say it. Buy a membership and then visit often, you know. So it's a great, great campus, great, great museum. So. Jordan, uh, uh, Gordon, it's been a pleasure to sit and chat with you for a little bit today. And uh, I really appreciate all the work you do. Thank you, Chris. And and thanks to, uh, to everybody out there who supports what you and I both do. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, indeed. I'm Chris Bukowski for the Emerging Civil War Podcast. On behalf of Gordon Jones, we'll see you online and on the battlefield.